Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast, where we focus on how authors found success, looking at strategies that have taken them to the top of the bestseller charts, as well as what they've learned from their mistakes. Because being an indie author is more than knowing the latest marketing trend. It's about being innovative and creative and learning from your mistakes. Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. I'm Sarah Rosette. And I'm Jamie Albright. And this week on the show, we have Gail Carriger. Yes, we do. And it was awesome. Yes. Oh my gosh. I am a huge Gail Character fan. So it was, I was a little bit of a fan girl on this uh, pot, on this episode. Um, so yeah, yeah. I was, I was too. Um, you have read her fiction and I read her nonfiction. Uh-huh. And so we talk about the heroine's journey and um, it was a wide ranging conversation. And it was. One of the things that I thought was interesting was we talked about what to do when things happen that go are at, that go wrong they're out of your control mm-hmm. and like how to recover and you know and mm-hmm. basically making lemonade out of lemons you know stuff like that yeah, yeah. so it was great she's just so smart and so wise and mm-hmm. yeah, yeah so she's done this she's a she started off traditional mm-hmm. she's still kind of a hybrid but most of her stuff now is is indie and mm-hmm. so yeah, yeah she's so just cool. interesting perspective on the industry and lots of good information. So, right, right. So stay tuned for that. So what yeah. have you been doing this week? Well, uh, I wrote at the beginning of the week, you know, just normal stuff. But then I had to have surgery on my thumb. Um, I was diagnosed with trigger finger a couple of weeks ago in both thumbs. And since my diagnosis, my husband has walked around the house with his hands <laughs> and finger guns going psh, 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 psh. So it's, uh, yeah, we're, the divorce will be final in just a few weeks. So just letting y'all know that. <laughs> no, it's just been really painful. And one of my thumbs, they did injections mm-hmm. in the thumbs. It, those ligaments get uh, caught or, or somehow frozen up. Anyway, yeah. uh, one of them did, was doing okay. But it's still painful, but I could live with it. Mm-hmm. And the other one, um, just kept getting worse and my left mm-hmm. thumb kept getting worse to the point where I just couldn't use it at all. Mm-hmm. And so I had the surgery. I was kind of worried because, you know, of course we make our living with our hands and mm-hmm. uh, I, but it was, it's been so easy. I mean, it was a small incision. They go in and clip it or not clip it, but they clean it out and get it unstuck. And I had a cyst in there. So that was making it worse. Mm-hmm. And then uh, by the second day, I was—I mean, I was able to use my hand even after the after the surgery. But by the second day, I could use my hand. And, I mean, it's painful at the incision side a little bit, mm-hmm. but other, it feels so much better. So I'm, I'm really <laughs> hopeful. And then while I was asleep, they gave me another injection in the other oh. thumb, and they must have gone like you know because it can only go so deep because uh-huh. you know, you're awake and going stop. But yeah. uh, while you're asleep, they can just jam it in there. And, um, so my right thumb feels fantastic too. Oh, so good. I'm very hopeful. So if you ever That's get a trigger good. finger diagnosis, don't panic. It's not, it hurts worse than it is. So mm-hmm. um, yeah. And that's really scary because like yeah, we, we do so much with our hands. Even if you do dictation, you still have to do some mm-hmm. typing. And usually, you know, you can't just like dictate yeah. everything. Right. So, exactly. so I know people will be curious. So is, do they know what causes it? Mm-mm. No, it just happens. Like I woke up the day after Christmas, I had not had any hand pain at all. Mm-hmm. And then woke up the day after Christmas and during the night, my thumb felt like it was spasming. Uh-huh. Like it would, it would bend and it just, it, it's a clicking sensation. But while I was asleep, it felt like it was spasming. Wow. And then the next day, the right thumb started doing the same thing. And then it just, the left thumb was kind of always worse than the right, right. Mm-hmm. But um, how, yeah, no, how weird. And there's no really injections or surgery are kind of the only thing. I yeah. think there is some physical therapy maybe you can do like early on, but by the time I got to the doctor, it was not good, yeah. especially for my left finger. So, um, yeah. yeah, well, it's weird. It was very, yeah. very weird. Um, but so, I'm so glad that it's better. Right. Well, I put it in my group, you know, that I was having surgery. I had trigger finger and I can't, a number of people said, Oh, I've had that. Or my husband oh, wow. had that. My husband had eight of his 10 fingers. That I oh, know no. <laughs> not all at the same time, but still, <laughs> um, you know, so it's wow. been, you know, like I said, it's so much better 
than it was, even though it's not completely healed or anything. Mm -hmm. It's still so much better than it was. So um, I'm very grateful about that. So okay. that's all I've done. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's plenty. No, <laughs> that's, <and> you- <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I've done some writing. It's been a weird, busy week. We moved one of our kids out of an apartment. So like we were out of town to do that and um, just crazy stuff going on. I finally got all my email sorted out, moved cool. to a new server. and That's good. Uh, yeah. I did it all myself because in the end it was easy. It was easier you know, in quotes to read the help documentation and watch YouTube videos on how to mm-hmm. do it. So, but it's done and it works. And I feel very accomplished that I did it all myself <laughs> Good for you. and I migrated everything and it all showed up. So uh-huh. that was uh-huh. good. That's so I did great. that. And um, yeah, that's been like the whole week because that just mm-hmm. took, you know, you know, moving and just yeah taking care of stuff like that. But I did have two um, cool things to talk about. One is there's this long, long article on the Ally blog called The Ultimate Guide to Self-Publishing Audiobooks. And I mean, it is the ultimate guide. It's just got tons of information in there. And um, it had some really interesting statistics. They, uh, a person from SoundCloud um, provided some of the information and a lot of the data, it sounds like. And it was about like, which types of audiobook readers by genre are more engaged and things like that. So it was very interesting, some statistics I hadn't seen before. Oh, that's and um, yeah. And then at the end they interview a couple of people and I'm one of the people that they talk about like how I do my audiobook. So there's like case studies at the end and you know, everybody does it different. So just right. lots of good information. So I'll link to that in the show notes. And then the other thing I did this week was um, AppSumo has a deal going on for a pop-up for your website for WordPress. And it's called opt in Lee, like O P T I N L Y. And so I decided to try that out and it was really easy to set up. And so now I've, I've not had a pop-up and that's been on my list to do for like, I don't know, a couple of years, Yeah, but it was really easy. And oh, now it's on cool. there and I've had some people sign up through it already. So so oh. I'll put a link in there to AppSumo and you can just search for Optinly. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. That's great. Yeah, that sounds that sounds good. Um yeah, Gail was talking about how she does her uh audiobooks too, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we talk about direct sales. Direct sales, yeah. Yeah. And that's I mean, another that's thing. Huge. Yeah. That's another thing I've done. I've actually sent the deposit yesterday for oh. um my audiobook. So that's yeah, exciting. exciting. Yeah, I'm excited. Uh the narrators are some of the best in the business. And so I'm, I'm very excited about that. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a timeline on? Uh, it's because the book's already out. We're not like rushing yeah. to get it mm-hmm. done, but mid March is when they'll start. So it'll probably yeah. be end of April, you know, wow. but yeah. I'm ex- so this is for the new book, the latest release, right? It, it's for homecoming King. The one yeah. came out in July. Yeah. I just, yeah. I'm not ready to do simultaneous releases yeah. yet. Uh, my writing schedule is a little too unpredictable for that. So, but, um, but I'm hoping like that we are having a new launch. Yeah. You know? Right. Exactly. And I'm hoping that, uh, I can jump into, um, the, uh, next book as soon as, you know, yeah. as soon as we finish this, you know, cause I'm yeah. hoping the next book will be done. So it'll be yeah. a little closer than six months. Um, uh, one thing just real quick that, mm-hmm. um, I was that was given a, a suggestion to me that novella that I have that I am going to put out. Um, someone suggested that I record the audio myself oh, yeah. uh, after listening to my Bernie book, which <laughs> <laughs> has been great, y'all. I've sold so many books from that that little seven minute clip that I you know story that I wrote and narrated, but. Um, record it and put it on my website as an audiobook yes. sign up list. Yeah. Yes. And you could use book funnel for that. Yeah. Because it's going to be short, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's not very long. So yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's so exciting. Yeah. That's so a that's good a good way. To, yeah. A good way to try out audio mm-hmm. is like to do something short instead of right. doing like a 70,000 word novel. Or right. Something exactly. Like that. <laughs> exactly. So uh, we'll stay tuned for that. Uh, yeah. yeah. So that's awesome. They're very yeah. exciting. Yeah. Okay. Well, we've talked a lot, so yep. we should probably get on, but um, it's a, it's a great interview. I know you guys are going to love it. Yep. So here's Gail. Today we have Gail Carriger with us. How are you today, Gail? I'm very well. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm super excited about this. Oh, we're so excited you're here. 
We are. So here, let me read a quick bio. Gail has multiple New York Times bestsellers and over a million books in print in dozens of different languages. She writes comedies of manners with, mixed with urban fantasy and sexy queer joy as G.L. Carragher. She is best known for the pa Parasol Protectorate and the Finishing School series. She was once an archaeologist and is fond of shoes, octopus, and tea. <laughs> That's a great bio. I love that. I know, me too. Uh, so Gail, tell us how you got into writing. How did I get into writing? I am one of those people who always wrote uh, for, since as long as I can remember. I just didn't think I would be a professional writer. I always just assumed I would be a career academic. Uh, so I sort of accidentally fell into the professional side of it because I wrote and once I finished something, I was like, I might as well try and get it published. And uh, that's how I ended up here. Yeah. <laughs> I just stumbled right into it. That's awesome. Though. I did. I, <laughs> yeah. I don't. I doubt that. I, I think that your writing is so <laughs> awesome. That yeah. Um, so you were you were an academic. So you did you teach archaeology? I did. Yeah. Oh, wow. uh, so I have two master's degrees, and I was a couple of years out from finishing my PhD when uh, I wrote Solace and then Changeless uh, hit the New York Times, and kind of everything sort of changed at that juncture. Um, and so I gave, I thought temporarily gave up my academic career. I left my department. I was like, I'll be back in a couple of years once this doesn't work out because it's a, you know, the writing industry and an artistic endeavor and those things never end well. Um, <laughs> and uh, 12 years later, occasionally my, uh, my professor will be like, you're your teapot's still here, yeah. your desk if you want it. Uh, and then <laughs> she retired recently. So I think, I think that chapter is, is definitely Close, closed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Your desk is pretty dusty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah but uh, uh, for the ed academically minded out there, anybody who's familiar with the university uh, system, I did have, I came back as adjunct faculty and they had to like excuse the no PhD on condition because uh, the courses I teach were required to graduate. Um, and so my professor took a sabbatical. And even though I had already left the program, there wasn't anybody in the area who could teach those <laughs> courses. And so I, I officially was adjunct faculty for a little while as well. So I've taught. Um, and I stayed pretty liminally. Uh, like that is what happens when you get very uh, you know high up in academia is you become an expert on very specific things. And there's no one but you to call on. Um, under certain circumstances. And um, and so I stayed like liminally involved in the archaeological field for a really long time uh, because I am the only expert in certain things in this certain area. Um, but I haven't been back in the field in about six years. So it's pretty I'm sure there are others now who can take who could <laughs> take over where I left off. Pass the baton. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that <laughs> or in my case, the pot, yeah. <laughs> the ceramic pot. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, we like to talk about um, just success and we like to ask everybody what their definition of success is because it's so different for so many different people. So what would be your definition <sighs> of success? That's a really good question. And you didn't give it to me ahead of time. Uh, so I didn't get a <laughs> chance to think about it. Um, I think for me, success. So um, just Bernard Shaw or somebody like that, uh, who famously said uh, success is largely a matter of holding on when everyone else is let go. So I do think stubbornness has a lot to do with success. As I have gone on in this field, I think serendipity has something to do with success. But I don't like blaming luck for everything mm -hmm. um, because I think the ability to capitalize on serendipity when it happens and putting yourself professionally in a space where you can um, is actually the largest part of turning serendipity into success. So for me, I think I've come around to that, which is it is stubbornness and it is luck, but it is also being prepared and willing and able to capitalize on both your own stubbornness and the luck when it comes along. Right. right. I love that. I love that um, being prepared, like being prepared and then knowing you're prepared to step and then stepping up. Yeah. Cause I think, I think a lot there's, of people that, that are prepared that they never take that step. And yeah. Just, yeah. Taking the risk. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I've come around to later on in life as well is, is just embracing failure. I think mm -hmm. a lot of times the mistakes I've made, I've been able to like convert into successes or at least testing the system in some way. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm obviously I'm an archeologist. I'm into data. Um, so that's one of the things that what I mean by capitalize sometimes means capitalizing on your failure to do something or your failure to prepare and just being like kind of nimble enough to be like, 
Um, everyone was complaining recently in one of the author forums that I belong to that Amazon had taken away their also bots mm -hmm. on some of their pages. Um, which, you know, this is a deep dive immediately into yeah. the business side of authordom. Sorry to everybody <laughs> out there. But um, everyone was just like freaking out and complaining about it. And me being me, I was like, you guys, this is a perfect opportunity to monitor your sales really closely mm -hmm. and see how much organic sales you're actually getting from those also bots. Like if mm -hmm. you see a major drop in sales, yes, that's bad. But also it's telling you something about Amazon's algorithm working in your favor when the also bots are up there. But if you don't see a drop in organic sales, mm -hmm. then the also bots don't matter anyway. So like right. you don't need to fret or freak out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, um, but that is the mindset of somebody who, you know, has been 12 years in the game and right. is like, right. oh, okay. So something's going terribly, terribly wrong. Mm -hmm. What should, what can I do to, to turn that, to try to turn it to an advantage somehow? Right. Yeah. Right. And that's the whole thing behind this podcast is mm -hmm. seeing what we've done right and what we've done wrong and learning lessons from both. So, yeah. so we are all into that. That's wonderful. Great. <laughs> Sorry, just on the same vein then, if that's what this podcast is about, um, yeah. everybody's been complaining about ACX, uh, which is Amazon's slash Audible's mm -hmm. distribution for audiobooks recently and how it's taking longer and longer and longer for audiobooks to clear quality control and get out there. So you can upload an, audi uh, an audiobook for a new release and it'll take two months, three months, six months in some mm -hmm. cases. Yeah. Um, and so this started happening about a year ago. Uh, and one of the things that I started to do is because I have some of my series exclusive to Audible and some of them not. So I've taken steps to move everybody off of Audible exclusivity. They'll still, I'll still go to Audible, but I'm, right. I'm taking out of the exclusive part of Audible. But I wanted to keep the last books and series is, you know, consistent. But since Audible hasn't uploaded it yet, uh, I don't have to be exclusive to them until it's, they've uploaded it, as far as I'm concerned. So what I've taken to doing is being like, you can buy it directly from me uh, ahead of time, and it will be available direct until Audible gets their stuff together and puts it right. up. <laughs> um, yeah. And so, uh, you know, I, I tell people what it mostly I tell my newsletter about this, but I was like, it's direct. I price it less than it will be priced mm -hmm. for because I kind of know how Amazon prices things. Um, and you own the MP3s yourself. They're proprietary. Mm -hmm. So you will have them on your computer. So Amazon can never take them away from you. If you mm -hmm. stop belonging to Audible, you're never going to lose them. You will own these audiobooks forever. Um, and so I took it as an opportunity to basically experiment with direct sales and audiobook. Um, yes. And that's been, for me, that's been really, really successful. Um, now yeah. I know that the audiobook direct sales directly to my, to my super fans will pay for the mm -hmm. audiobook. And so everything after that, once it goes wide and goes up out on to, into the world is, is, is profit for that audiobook, which is great. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Right. That's what I've been doing. I did Seriously that too. It, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, just, I, I was think like, I heard a, you talk about it on a podcast. Yeah. A little yeah. window of opportunity and we might as well take advantage of it. You know? Yeah. And, and so. from business perspective, you're using scarcity and exclusivity mm -hmm as to temptations for that. <laughs> um, and I basically tell them, like, I t I'm very frank with my readers. And so I basically, I'm like, this was going on. I don't, so I don't know how long it's going to be available. So right. get it if you like it. Um, and I have, you know, such dedicated readers and super fans that a lot of them will buy it because they want to own the MP3s. And then yeah. they will also use their Audible credits on it later because they yeah. like that ecosystem and they want to stay within the listening app. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I also have other people who buy it bec and because they buy all formats. They like to have a print edition and a digital edition that goes with them everywhere and then an audio edition. So, they come listen. so um, yeah, it's been, that's been, and that was just, I just started doing that because Audible <laughs> was pissing me off, basically. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. excellent. I understand that. Exactly. So what do you wish you'd known about writing and craft when you started? I feel like craft advice is really hard for me to give, and I almost never do it, which is weird from someone who just wrote a craft on fiction <laughs> book. <laughs> There's a reason that that wasn't like, here's what, how you write, like sit down right. at a desk and, you know, like I don't, I do that's It's not that kind of craft book. It's like, here's the, some of the foundational chassis. But, um, and that is because I do a lot of writing retreats with other writers. I hang out with lots of other writers and I just know that everybody's process is different. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't try to give craft advice that often. But what I will say is um, the thing that surprised me as a person who likes systems, I like to try and figure out how I work and then like groove to that and make that 
as consistent as possible. I like to take away the distract, like whatever works for me. I like to capitalize on it. The unfortunate <laughs> side effect of that is every single book is different. It's different. And, yes. and you mm -hmm. would think, I mean, I have 30 books now and 12 years. You would think I would get some kind of, <laughs> nope, <laughs> no. And every single time, like during the writing process, I'm like, oh, this book is going to, it's going to do that. Is it? Um, and every single time during the business production end of the process, I'm like, oh, ACX is going to like stop working or, you know, like there's always every single time there, you're going to get at least one, like, oh, I got to learn a new skill for dealing with this thing. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and like this year as for, you know, as with everybody, it was like, how does isolation and like stress affect how Everything. I can produce or even if yeah. I can produce. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, again, it's me. So I'm like, that's it. That was interesting. I reacted that way. That's interesting. <laughs> hmm. mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But yeah, so I think the big thing I have is like, I'm sorry to have to say this to everyone out there, but it's always going to be different and it's always going to be evolving. And I think that's just the consequence of being in a creative endeavor. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there are certainly things I've learned about myself. Like, I feel like most authors have slumps, especially when you're writing long form, novella length, fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and s people slump at different points. I have a two third and a, a, a one third and a two third slump. Like I know right around 30% of the way through the book, I hate the book. I mm -hmm. suck. I'm the worst writer in the universe and it's never going to be finished. <laughs> right. And right. it will like, I swear, I, I will start feeling that voice in my head and look up and there it says 33%. And I'm like, how did you know? Yeah. I work in script. I work in scripter, <laughs> so I always have my targets and everything. Um, and then, and then I'm like, okay, we'll get through this. We'll get through this, and we get through it, and we're writing the climax, and everything's going fine. And then at seventy, <laughs> then I'm like, I hate it. It's never going to be done. And you're that much closer to the end, but still. Um, yes. And I'm like, oh, this is my process. <laughs> yes. So there's definitely things like that that I have learned about myself, right, but I right. feel like you do get those things. Mm -hmm. under control the more you write but mm -hmm. also each one is also different it's in different. unique yeah. and special ways <laughs> yeah this year has taught me I would have been a terrible pioneer woman like terrible <laughs> because of the isolation plus the just constant stress and like catastrophe waiting around every corner um I I would just be a terrible pioneer woman I would never get out of bed my family would not have Clean clothes or bread, I guess, is what they meant. <laughs> so. I think about that in terms of, like, because I studied ancient cultures, like, mm -hmm. in terms of the stressors, particularly on, on women in ancient cultures, um, and what it's like to be in kind of more survival mode, mm -hmm. but also how you lived a lot closer to death in mm -hmm. the past yeah. and it was more imminent and you know most women would have lost children mm -hmm. um everybody would have lost their parents younger and more frequently mm -hmm. and you know that sort of thing mm -hmm. and so like i think um there the the transience of existence in the past probably mitigated stress to a certain extent i don't right. know because yeah. i didn't live like that Mm -hmm. um, but we have been protective from certain mm -hmm. things as a consequence of, you know, mod modern society, particularly if you're middle class. Um, and so, like, we're ill-equipped for this kind of stress in a way. Mm -hmm. um, as yeah, evidenced I, by I how we've all agree. handled it. <laughs> yes, as evidenced by this last year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, switching tracks a little bit, what, did you, what do you wish you'd known about marketing? Oh, um, so much. Uh, <laughs> I, I read an interesting article several years ago now that was talking about um, uh, San Francisco Art Institute here in um, California, and they were instituting a mandatory course on small businesses that if you graduated with a degree in art, you had to have this like small business course, which was everything from like financial planning, LLCs, grant writing, that you know, like yeah, that sort of wow. thing. And I wish everybody in any creative field got that <laughs> um because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, they i've read fortunately for me i'm a researcher i like nonfiction, so I've, but i've read an unprecedented number of like business books in strange things like whether i needed to incorporate like i'll have to read a book about that you know mm -hmm. um and it's just and it uh, those sorts of things i think do not matter whether you are traditionally published or independent published or a hybrid author um 
you will benefit from knowing those kinds of things, even if what that knowledge is going to take you towards is choosing the right expert to handle it for you. Mm-hmm. Um, I am a great believer in like having as much foundational knowledge as possible, but also a great believer in, in like, like I like to know how the combustion engine, but that doesn't mean I'm going to like, I know to know how it works, but it doesn't mean I'm going to change my own oil. Like I'll find yeah. someone yeah. <laughs> to do that for me. I mean, it's yeah. kind of how I've approached the publishing industry in general. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I feel really lucky to have had that mindset because I feel a lot of like super creative minds don't don't handle the duality that's required of us because it is required of us now, all of us. Um, you don't get to not know about marketing anymore. And again, it it's almost worse if you're trad because you need to know about it so you know what they're messing up and like all of the holes that you have to fill in for them that you don't even recognize that they're holes if you if you don't have some mm-hmm. kind of marketing background. Right. Um, so yeah, preparation, you know, reading. There's a lot of great podcasts like this one, um, and also blogs and stuff out there. Um, but yeah, uh, so I guess I, I wish I had some sort of small business knowledge wow. that I had brought to the table going in because um, I've kind of had to curb it together over the years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think and all I of think, us are in that situation. You know, yeah, very very few of us like did, you know, small business anything. <laughs> zero. I had zero, zero small business. Had it not been for podcasts, I would have just been completely Yeah, podcasts lost. are my lifesaver too. I'm a huge mm-hmm. consumer of podcasts. I listen to them all the time. And now, like now at this stage of my career, it's not really for me anymore, except for maybe like the six-figure author or something. Mm-hmm. Um, but I still listen to a lot of it because the world changes so quickly and you know, there are always new technologies and stuff like that. And like, I feel like I'm super lucky if I get like one little nugget, but I still got mm-hmm. one little nugget and mm-hmm. still got to listen to my friends and my ears, you know, yeah, even yeah. if I don't know these people, I like, consider right. them my friends. Right, <laughs> yeah. right, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, on that note, I will say that one of the things I brought to the table marketing wise, which I feel like is a really hard lesson for most authors to learn, but that we all have to learn which is um, your story out the other side of the creation process is a product Mm -hmm. and it is an asset. Mm -hmm. Um, And I am a ceramicist um, and so I used to make pottery to sell. And I think that really helped me because you learn to just like make the piece of art and then you sell it to someone else and you will never see it again. And you don't know what they're going to do with it. Uh, they might break mm-hmm. it. They might use it as a chamber pot. They might like put it on a shelf and never drink out of it ever again. You don't know yeah. what's going to happen. Um, and developing that attitude about your story, unfortunately, is also really healthy because... I mean, Trad teaches this to you to you really fast because they market it badly. They put terrible copy on the back of it. They give you an awful cover. Like they are going to mess it up some way and you're going to have to get lo- used to your baby being wrapped in trash or whatever it is they're going to mm-hmm. do to your baby. Mm-hmm. Um, but in indie, like you also have to let go of it being your baby and realize that it is a thing you have produced and the skill that you bring to the table is the ability to write more things. And you got to learn to let go of that first one. Um, uh, There's a, was a poster on a wall in one of my early creative writing classes, which was don't fall in love with your first draft. And I feel like don't fall in love with your first book Mm -hmm. is a lesson everyone needs to learn, but also just don't fall in love with the book. It's Mm -hmm. not, I've been helped by the idea that it's not really mine. Once it's mine until it's, packaged and put out into the world and then it kind of doesn't belong to me anymore because people are going to bring your consumers are also your readers are going to bring their own set of baggage to it they're going to willfully mm-hmm. misinterpret what you've written they're going to write you angry emails they're going to write you terrible reviews and if you can make this jump where you like you, there's a separation between your story and your book mm-hmm. and your book is kind of their book too mm-hmm. um, and being able to let go of that is going to keep you emotionally healthier. <laughs> wow, that's yes. so good. I saw just not too long, oh, about a week ago, some lady said, how do you respond to a review on the on Amazon? She was new, obviously. And people were like, don't respond. <laughs> do not respond. And she said, but they they don't, they don't they misinterpreted what I said or, or you know, they I, they said I said this, I didn't say that. 
I just want to explain, and I wanted, I didn't respond because most people yeah, you can't. Already, <laughs> had already told her, you know, but that's the truth. I mean, yeah, people just will interpret it based on their experience. And yeah, you might not, might not have said that, but that's how they read it. And yeah, so you just have And there's to nothing, you can change their yeah. mind and there's no explaining. And there's a part of me that's also like, I'm a writer. Mm-hmm. If you didn't get it, I messed up somehow. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. you know, and maybe you just misread the sentence, in which case it really <laughs> is your fault. But, um, you know, if you really didn't get what I was trying to do with this book, then, you know, that's my fault. Mm-hmm. Um, and we both have choices on this. And my choice is to ignore what you said. Mm-hmm. And your choice is never to buy another one of my books. Right. We could both make that choice. And then, <laughs> and then we're all happy. <laughs> and everyone's happier for that outcome. Yeah. The worst is when they say, um, I didn't, I didn't like this or I didn't, you know, I don't like what she did with this or whatever, but I'll read one. I'll read her next book. And I just want to go, no, don't really. It's, it's not going to get any it's better. Okay. <laughs> um, I've taken to being like someone, if someone writes me an angry note or said something mm-hmm. nasty on the internet, I've just been like, here's a whole list on my blog of other authors That's who right. I love that right. like maybe <laughs> don't make those mistakes. Try yeah. them. You know, that's a great idea. Look at all these other options. That's a great idea. Aren't me. (laughs) So what assumptions did you make at the beginning of your career and looking back, did they turn out to be right or wrong? I was really lucky. So I grew up in fandom and back in the day when I was doing a lot of stuff in fandom, um, they had writer's tracks at almost every sci-fi fantasy convention that I went to and then include like the little conventions and writer's tracks were basically like, this is what a query letter is. And this is how to write one. Um, this is sci-fi fantasy. So you were kind of expected to take the traditional route. You were expected to take that route by writing some short stories, which would get you attention. And then maybe you would write a novel and then you would start querying. Like there was a kind of pattern, mm-hmm. But still, like, wide-eyed little academic me, like, went to all of these and carefully took notes and, like, tried to do my best and follow the pattern as as dictated. Um, But that allowed me kind of contact with other writers who were further along in their careers than I was. And, you know, you can kind of pick up the jadedness of it, but also, um, you know, there there was some inherent truths within jaded older authors complaining about the industry. So I went into publishing and and for anyone who doesn't know, I'm a traditionally published author who transitions to being self-published. I'm still technically hybrid, but most of my income now comes from self-publishing. Um, but it, it, it left also like I grew up on an art sort of an artist commune kind of thing. So like how the artist is treated <laughs> by middlemen and other professionals within their spheres was something that I kind of knew about. So I feel like I was a little better prepared than a lot of new authors were a decade ago when I went in. Um, and that was mostly just me trying to educate myself in the, with the means that I have possible. I mean, nowadays people are lucky. They, you know, authors are on podcasts all the time talking about this sort of thing. So you can be even better prepared. Um, so I didn't have a ton of assumptions and I'm a fatalist and a pessimist anyway. So like anytime anything went wrong, I was like, oh, that's going wrong. Okay. How do we deal with that? <laughs> You're prepared. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you were prepared. Yeah. Well, we've already touched on this a little bit, but um, have you ever made a mistake that turned out to be a good thing? Oh, I think um, do, 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 do. Uh, we did touch, touch on this a little bit. I mean, I talked about ACX, like, mm-hmm. um, so I've made kind of craft mistakes where I was like, well, I have to retcon that in future books because I write a bunch of books in the same series. Um, and that I find kind of fun because I'm like, oh, how do I explain that mistake I made? You know, I did a <laughs> world building and then suddenly something <laughs> broke the world building and now I have to explain how. Um, mm. So I, I do that in fiction quite a bit just because, you know, with with 20 something books in the same universe with lots of crossover yeah. characters and crossover elements, it kind of gets hard to keep track of things after right. a while. I um, mean, with like super obsessive fans, you, someone's going to spot your mistakes. Um, they help you I've <laughs> taken, yes, I've absorbed some of those super obsessive, obsessive fans and turned them into beta readers and been like, okay, uh, let's try and catch this before it goes out to the broader mm-hmm. audience. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I mentioned the Amazon also about things and stuff like that and, and audibles. And, and that's kind of mostly the lessons I've taken is just been like, I've really tried to train my brain to think in terms of when something goes wrong, mm-hmm. 
how can I capitalize on that? Mm -hmm. And one of that, like the two advantages that I have under those circumstances are a very healthy newsletter list and um, direct sales. So I would say those are two things as an author, I would consider uh, the direct sales maybe is slightly later on in your career. You don't necessarily need that right away. Um, but my only huge regret as a, as a longtime author now is that I didn't get my newsletter going early enough. And I, I, I don't care how little you have out into the world. Um, training yourself to start a news- newsletter, to do one regularly, um, and to get people onto it is like the single most important thing for your long-term career, if long-term career is what you're after. Yeah, yeah. that's absolutely, and that is a theme with yeah. all of our guests. I mean, yeah. you know, it comes up uh, again and again. Um, and the and the piece of advice I would give that I think a lot of authors don't give, um, and this it, these become a, is because I come from the traditional route, and I was a high, I was a front list author for my publishing house, which means they sent me on book tours and stuff like that. Is take a physical sign up sheet for your newsletter with you when you do in-person events. Don't do a digital one. A lot of newsletters have a digital option. There's a psychological human <laughs> thing about touching somebody else's technology. So you can't have your iPod out and iPad out and expect people to sign up for your newsletter. Yeah. It must be a pen and paper. Um, also, it gives really shy people something to do <laughs> while you're signing their books for them. And so they don't have to make small talk. Um, yeah. yeah. And mine is just a real simple printed piece of paper that says the name of my newsletter, the cheer up and like, would you like to sign up for it? And like, there's a little key code for coming up with a fake parasol protector name. If you want, you can sign up under your code name. Oh, that's All you great. need to give me is an email. And then I bring it home and I input them into the system. That is the thing I wish I had done sooner because mm-hmm. I did massive in-person events earlier on in my career and I did not capitalize it on that. But yeah, if you are the type of author who does events and conventions and signings and all that sort of thing um take a physical sign up sheet with you yeah that's a great tip mm-hmm. it is um so what's what about the opposite have you ever had something you thought this is a brilliant idea this is a home run and then it turned out not to be <laughs> yeah um Again, the, I've had that experience on the craft end of the spectrum with stories that I'm like, this is so good. And then either like I put it out there and it just falls completely flat or my agent is like, no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just n- no, uh, my agent and I. Have, so um, as a traditional author, I have had the same agent my whole career, which is really unusual, 12, 13 years now. Mm-hmm. Um, I've never I, but I have a which, you know, if I had to pick, I'd pick having the long term relationship with the agent. I've had multiple different editors, um, like most traditional authors. I've been orphaned, as we call it, several times. Mm-hmm. Um, but my agent has always stuck with me, and she is fantastic. She's great, and I love her to death. Um, and she has she represents like Hugh Howie and like some major indie authors as well. And so um, she's been with me through the transition, and she's still awesome. Um, but she, I will call her up occasionally and just be like, uh, so I use a very cross phrase. Um, and I'll be like, which is basically uh, like slang for like, do I have the weight to throw around under these circumstances or do I back down? And, um, and she will honestly tell me like, it's not worth it back down or yeah, fight this one. Mm -hmm. Um, that's great. So she's a great sounding board for business stuff and she's very practically business minded. That's one of the reasons, um, we have a long running relationship and you keep going together. Um, so she checks me, uh, (laughs) with those things. Um, but yeah, so I'm, yes, I have, I definitely have, uh, Mm -hmm. I have like screamed at my German publishers because the covers were terrible and they changed the titles for no good reason. And, Uh, you know, like, and, and uh, this is the other thing about being a trad author in particular is it's your name on the cover and no readers, especially a decade ago, don't understand how the industry works at all. And so they think you have influence and you control everything. Mm -hmm. Um, And so everything is always your fault. You know, if the translation is bad, it's your fault. And I'll be like, but I don't speak Turkish. (laughs) (laughs) Like I could check to make sure they didn't like, I'm, I'm sorry. Like, what do you want me to say? (laughs) um, But also they tend to think that the author has a lot more control over the finished product than we do. Um, and even in indie, there are certain things we can't do or, we you know, like um, I had a very angry email about the fact that I had been forced to change my name 
for the San Andreas Shifter books because obviously there's so much sex in the books. The publishers decided that like I clearly um, needed a new name, and I was like, no, I I made that decision. Yeah. <laughs> and here's the blog post where I talk about that, right, um, right. and why I chose to do that. Yes. Um, you know, so sometimes people get angry on your behalf. <laughs> and yeah. I'll be like, don't waste your energy. It's it'll be okay. Right. Um, so mm-hmm. you know, it's sort of that kind of thing, I guess. Mistakes yeah. wise. Yeah. Yeah. The traditional publishing world is interesting. And I've had that too, where readers think that you have way more control. Like, well, why was this book out in hardcover, but this one was not? And you're like, yes, yes. No idea. But please the <laughs> publisher and ask. Maybe they'll tell yeah, you. There's <laughs> a lot of people going like, you know, you, you could ask the publishers. Like, and partly yeah. that's because like, I just don't want to explain the industry to you. Like, yeah. I don't, you know, like my, um, we have all sorts of sagas, like, the, like mm-hmm. just really like that's the thing that happened. Uh, Barnes and Noble, like I did a deal with them where I signed 500 books for them and then they just lost them all. And, oh my gosh. Uh, you know, this was for a new release, you know, to push oh. to get on the New York Times and all that sort of thing. And they just lost them all. And instead of being like, sorry, we'll transfer this and you can we'll, we'll send you the regular one and like Gail will sign book plates or something. Um, they just canceled them all the orders and for those of you who don't know to make like the new york times or a bestseller listing especially for a hardcover you Mm -hmm. actually logistically don't need to sell that many books it kind of depends on who else is out and stuff like that but the Mm -hmm. cap is something like ten thousand on the list that i tend to make um and Mm -hmm. so losing 500 out the gate and also getting a bunch of people mad so they then didn't they thought they were still going to get it or they didn't or they just didn't order Mm -hmm. it or whatever um, it meant that that was the first of my books that didn't make the New York Times list. Oh. And I was like, well, thanks. You know, like, and I was like, there's literally nothing I can do about it. But who woke up in the morning after Barnes & Noble sent the cancellation notice <laughs> the day before release to 500 angry emails from fans? Yeah. That would be me. Because yes. whose name is on that cover? Mm-hmm. That'd be mine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. mm. um, oh, that's stressful. So, Hard yeah, to stuff like that, from. you know, yeah. and that ended up, you know, but the, you know, the, the upside of that is I ended up like very drunk because I happen to be a world fantasy sobbing <laughs> in public in front of everybody. And like two of my author friends who would become some of my best author friends of all time, partly because of this sort of protectively huddled around me and kind of <laughs> talked me down from the situation. Um, and I was about to go on book tour too for this book. Mm. And um and one of them, Peter Bratt, who is just one of the most wonderful people who I totally adore, um, who's a huge author, but kind of in overseas in Europe. Um, he was like, here's what you do. He's like, you just tell everybody you will send them a book plate. Like, and he's like, you will go home. And I was like, you're absolutely right. Like everyone knows I'm on book tour right now. And mm-hmm. so I just like had a little email I sent to everyone that was basically like, I'm so sorry this happened. It really isn't my fault. Yeah. But as soon as I get back from book tour, I will send you a book plate if you send me your email. And so, you know, Barnes and Noble messed up. I went home. I signed about 300 book plates and was out the expense and the time and the stamps and everything. Um, Just mailed them off to everybody because I was just like, this is the only way I can make reparations and I have to do something. Um. You know, but I should have gotten all the, I should have gotten all those people on the newsletter. Yeah. <laughs> <I should've done. laughs> but I think that's an important that's an important point in that whether you're traditional or indie, we're responsible for our career. Like we and it yeah. kind of goes back to your whole, you know, have you made a mistake or have negative things happen and you know you they turned out to be good. We're responsible for yeah. our mindset, the the way we process it. I mean, yes, we can get drunk in public. And, you know, that's a first thing for me, but, um, but, but then we have to pull ourselves together and go forward if we're going to continue in this business, because there's stuff like that all the time. I mean, constantly not like that, but you know, big stuff that could derail us easily if we don't check ourselves and then get back to work and do the thing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really hard because, I mean, we talked about this again, like to be a creative Mm-hmm. And be like, okay, it's like this terrible thing happened. And I have people writing me very angry emails about something which is totally outside of my control. And tomorrow I have to get on a plane and do 10 cities in 10 days mm-hmm. in front of crowds of people. Mm-hmm. Um, and feel good about you know, myself. <laughs> and feel good about yeah. this book that is being like 
screwed over. Yes. Yes. <laughs> like, oh, that's terrible. You yeah. know, and um, but like you have to do that, and like mm-hmm. and that in your career is going to happen constantly, mm-hmm. and and that's and like right back to that other mindset, which is like let go of the book. The book has happened. It's out in the world or not out in the world, depending on like decisions that others are making for you. You know, yeah. like I mean, I had authors who went through Amazon fail when Amazon just yeah. was, was in contract negotiations with various big publishers, and then just like. One of my best friends had a release come out. He was Macmillan. Mm-hmm. Macmillan was just, Amazon took the buy button off of all Macmillan books for like a yeah. month. And he was like, oh, well. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, well, there's always nothing things that are <laughs> out of our control. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And we just yeah. have to figure out the best thing we can do, like mourn yeah. before the horrible and thing that happened and, move and then go on. on. And, but, yeah. But realize, you know, the answer as a creative is that there's always another book That's around true. the corner. That is very true. And you get to have that. And that's kind of exciting. (laughs) So talking about more books, um, we want to talk about your new nonfiction book for writers called The Heroine's Journey. So can you, for people who aren't familiar with this, can you just give us a quick little, I don't know if it's possible, a quick little summary of the difference (laughs) between The Hero's Journey and The Heroine's Journey? Because they are very different. (laughs) They are very different. And this is one of those things that like the reason I wrote this book um, it's so big, I, right? Yeah, it's because it's such a huge topic that I was like, got to write a book about it. Um, so I, uh, like I said, I grew up in cons, and I, I have always been part, like, liminally as a, you know, as a fan, uh, and now as a writer, part of the writer community in the sci-fi fantasy world in particular. And the hero's journey is talked about a lot. Um, I'm also an archaeologist. I have a minor in classical uh, because I was an originally a classical archaeologist. And um, one of my focuses was gender and mythology uh, for for one of my various minor degrees. Um, And so I, I mean, we were taught this anyway, but I learned about the heroine's journey as part of that process. I learned about both the hero and the heroine's journeys, specifically when sourced in um, ancient myths from sort of the Mediterranean region. And um, so I came to conventions, assuming everyone else had those two (laughs) <laughs> in place as as like narrative chassis you know it's like going to a museum and seeing the classical artists you know from the renaissance period or whatever and like knowing the religious iconography that they're drawing on or the roman and greek mythology that they're drawing on for their paintings like you like if you got it drilled into you you kind of like what do you mean you don't know this stuff um and so I would go to these cons and people would talk about the hero's journey and I would be like, yeah, but the heroine's journey, blah, 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 on, on panels. And everyone would be like, what is what? the heroine's journey? And then there would be a hand up in the audience and someone would be like, is there a book? And I'd be like, no, there's not a book. There are books about the heroine's journey, but they're like Jungian, you know, psychological yeah. solo yeah. journey analyses yeah. and stuff. Um, and this happened for a decade until I was finally like, well, I guess I have to write the book. So I wrote the book. Yes. Um, but <laughs> the, the source difference. So if you know the hero's journey, you know, it is this sort of pattern of withdrawal and return. Um, but like from a narrative perspective, from the perspective of somebody writing this journey, it has very interesting, interesting things to say about what drives a journey. Um, what is the strength and weaknesses in your hero and your villains? Um, and, how depictions of power are within the context of the journey, um, which these are things that as writers we think about because they are the drivers of conflict and plot. Um, And so when you are analyzing the hero's journey from a sort of writer narrative perspective, those are kind of the things that for me, at least you want to think about. Um, So uh, for example, um, a hero is increasingly, increasingly isolated as part of his journey. And I'll use gender binary for the sake of ease, uh, but a hero can be female or male or (laughs) non-gendered or agendered or anything in between. Uh, um, The the term hero is for the archetype. Um, And so he, for lack of a better pronoun, goes on this journey, is increasingly isolated, and as a result of his isolation becomes increasingly strong. So a a hero becomes stronger the more self-reliance he has. And he usually ends his journey with a a, a one-on-one battle or an extreme fight with the villain um, that results in him being victorious and achieving a boon of some kind. In ancient mythology, it's often a physical thing like a sword or an herb of immortality or some sort of vehicle power. Uh, which he then brings back to his civilized world that improves the world and makes everything better as a result of his actions. Um, and there's nothing 
innately, I'm not making a moral judgment on these. That's kind of what, and there's something very exciting about this narrative and it is very endemic in Western uh, pop culture in particular. And you can think about suspense novels and action movies and all of these things. You've seen this many, many times. Recently, um, Wonder Woman, for example, is a classic hero, like truly classical classic hero. She's even a demigod, which is, which is something that all of the ancient Greek heroes were. Um, and often the hero, as a result of his journey, no longer really conforms or fits into society. He has gotten so isolated and he's so extremely good at what he does, which is usually violent, that he doesn't really fit into society anymore. And so he must continue questing. He must leave civilization and return out and continue questing, continue his boon, or he self-destructs and he ends up in pathos. This is the classical journey. And so but you'll often see this in modern narratives as well. Uh, you can think about like Lee Childs, Jack, is that Jack Reacher? Like those mm -hmm. kinds of books. Um, Reacher never ends up with anybody. He can never have a partner. Like she is always going to have to die because he yes. must be isolated because he's powerful when he's isolated. And so, you know, he has a problem. These heroes often have problems with connections and intimacy. You know, they're always left going at it alone. I mean, I love the Born series personally, yes. but again, increasingly yes. constantly isolated, like must self-rely. You look will we'll establish connections and then those connections will die. Mm -hmm. uh, the hero always loses his mentor, those, those sorts of things. So mm -hmm. yeah, those are drivers for your narrative if you're writing those narratives. The, hero, the heroine's journey also has these same patterns of withdrawal and return and visits to the underworld, but her motivations and her drivers and her definitions of success and strength and victory are completely different. In fact, they're kind of the polar opposite to the hero. Um, a heroine is the kind of, is used as a chassis for things like romance novels exclusively. All romance novels are heroines journeys by their nature, but also a lot of successful Bildesroman or coming of age narratives that are in young adult books. Mm -hmm. um, and also in a lot of strange things that you might not think of, like cozy <laughs> mysteries, uh, buddy cock dramas, and those sorts of things. And that's because what the heroine's journey is, is about strength and connection. So what a heroine does is isolation's her enemy. She becomes weaker the fewer connections she has and the more isolated she has. Instead, what she tends to do is gather people around her who all have different strengths and weaknesses that she learns to accommodate and activate and balance against herself and her own strengths and weaknesses. She networks, she information gathers, spy characters are often heroines because they're really good at connecting with people and then collecting information. Mm -hmm. um, and so her success then and her ability to achieve this goal is as this kind of networked community. Um, and so what she's very good at is asking for help which is a psychologically really difficult thing for modern American society in particular to comprehend as a strength, but it is a strength to know when you need help and be able to ask for it is a strength, especially mm. in the heroine's journey. Yeah. Um, and so you see these heroines like, so their conflict then is people trying, so the, the bad guys are trying to isolate them. And if you think about romance novels, or if you think about something like the Harry Potter books, which are classic heroine's journey, Harry is always in danger when he's by himself. Like he always gets isolated and his friends have to come help him out. Get, like Hermione has to be there and give him advice just to go to the library and research something and bring that to him. Or Ron has to come in and be comedic and help him and find the sword and bring it back to him. Mm -hmm. You know, like Harry is also mm -hmm. always stronger. And so you end up with heroine's journeys, like um, great moments of power and emotional resonance are group gatherings, family dinners, weddings sexual encounters, those sorts of things are moments of strength in these narratives. And so as writers, what we search for as a toolbox when we're encountering writer's block or something like that is going to be completely different between these two journeys. So it kind of behooves you to know which journey you're on because then you're, the toolkit you have access to is going to be completely different. And I, I kept, you know, talking to creative writers who are like, um, you know, like, they didn't verbalize it this way, but essentially they would be like isolating their character and then their character would start to suffer from inertia. And I'd be mm -hmm. like, have you considered the fact that you're writing, you're probably writing a heroine's journey. And so you just, you need to stop isolating them. And instead you need to introduce a new character that's going to give them a bit of information that they need. Mm -hmm. And that's going to push them to move in a new direction. 
Um, and that's just because if you're writing a heroine, she needs contact with people. Um, you know, so yeah. So that was a long answer. <laughs> that was so interesting that but I loved it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because that's something that I I was not familiar with it. And when I was reading your book, I was like, oh yes, this is because I write cozy mysteries and historical mysteries. And so that's the you know that's exactly what my characters do, you know? So it was great just to see it all written out. And I just wanted to uh, pull out something else from the book. Um, You say the heroine's journey, journey, when critically reviewed or discussed, tends to be viewed as smarmy, silly, frivolous, sappy, cheesy, tropey, effeminate, and weak. And I just want to say thank you for calling this out because (laughs) I see this over and over and over again, When especially when people talk about like reading romance or cozies or things like that. They'll say, well, I just needed a palate cleanser or I've been reading a lot of dark, gritty things and I needed something light. It's like they're making an excuse for reading these things and or they'll say, well, I only read romance, you know, when I'm, you know, down or something when I need a, yeah. you know, and so I'm, I'm just thankful that you pointed that out and I think that hopefully we can kind of change, like even as an author, I'm trying to change the way I talk about my books and be like, this is, because if you look at a thriller like Jason Bourne, someone that would be in that situation over and over and over and over again, that's probably not realistic. And people criticize cozies for not being realistic. But there's so many things that, you know, I feel like we just need to get over that, you know, <laughs> and just move it's, on. It's very interesting to me because of that, like, specifically the word tropey, which is thrown at romance get a lot. Part of that, I think, is because, at least now especially, writers recognize that they use tropes in romance a lot. Uh, Mm -hmm. But so do readers. And readers are like, oh, I really like the friends Mm -hmm. to lovers trope. Uh, That's Mm -hmm. something I read for and I really enjoy it. Um, What people who read suspense or um, like crime thriller mysteries or, you know, various other things don't realize is that there are just as many tropes going on in those narratives. Mm -hmm. Um, You're just you just pick them up and read them because you enjoy them without really realizing how much trope is going on. And I've been thinking about this recently because I've been watching a romantic suspense, um, which does not get translated to the screen very often for good reason. It's a really hard demographic to hit. Usually you get romances with like a cozy mystery subplot or something, Mm -hmm. or you get a suspense with maybe a romance thread. She will probably die if it's a real suspense, but, um, or he, (laughs) depending. Um, but uh, so romantic suspense is unusual. And, I, and this particular series, I'm, I'm not sure if it, it is it's being successful, but it's still interesting to watch. But as, as part of that, I have been noticing some of the visual tropes that mysteries use in particular, which I've never really paid attention to before. I'm a consumer of cozy mysteries in particular. I love British cozies. I was raised on them. Mm-hmm. Um, but things like the zoom in on the clue or the red herring, depending on what it is. And you're yeah. like, oh, of course, that's yeah. in all of these. And there are descriptive tools for that when you are writing these kinds of books, like how you write them and what character archetypes you're using. Whether Mm -hmm. it's hero or heroines, they're there. They're in those. And they are nearly satisfying your audience's expectations, whether you are the audience or you are the writer for that audience. And there is an audience and you're writing for it no matter what. (laughs) And sometimes the audience is you, but you Mm -hmm. also have tropes and things that you like. Um, and sort of recognizing that and realizing that all you're doing is providing a satisfying read to somebody and somebody's satisfying read is a hero's journey and other people's satisfying read is a heroine's journey. There's mm-hmm. nothing innately better or worse about either one. Um, what has happened and why the heroine's journey in particularly has been disenfranchised as a kind of narrative has to do with the history of this journey, the consumers of it, mostly women, yeah. um, but also like sort of the critical disenfranchise of it, mostly male critics criticizing a genres that are mostly written by women and for women over the years. Um, but also it has an innately weird human association with it, which is that heroine's journeys are more conducive. In fact, they're exclusively conducive to romance because they're about connection, but also to comedy. Um, and comedy, if you write funny, is always critically disenfranchised. People just don't respect humor. 
think about like what wins awards, what wins literary prizes, what wins the Oscars every year. Yes, sometimes comedies take it, but most of the time, um, and I think as human beings, we tend to focus on the negative. Mm -hmm. Um, But in a weird way, we admire the negative, like being able to make somebody feel sad or scared or sick to their stomach or, you know, all of these sorts of things is, is weirdly admirable. Whereas being able to make them laugh or feel happy or comforted is somehow not as good. It's not as looked up to. Yeah. yeah, It's not as admired. Yeah. And that, and that, it doesn't have really anything to do with sort of the history of these genres as much as the sort of critical response to these genres does. But, um, but it is interesting to me. And I think it's, I think it is just a a human nature thing. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when your fans are saying, you know, like I pick it up, it's partly like I have to sort of apologize Mm -hmm. for wanting to be happy and for wanting to consume something that makes me happy, which is really Mm -hmm. weird to me. (laughs) And I was like, I don't know if we can fix that social flaw because it's a deeply (laughs) social flaw. Um, So one of the ways I own it now is, you know, when people ask me what I do, I tend to say I write commercial genre fiction, which is almost always heroine's journey. And and like, cause I, cause I kind of like to own the commerciality of it too. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, I make, I write stuff that people want to read and pay me for. Like I'm Mm -hmm. I'm not going to apologize for that anymore. I'm done Mm -hmm. with that. (laughs) Um, but the other thing I say is I write comfort reads. I write mm-hmm. things that bring people comfort and happiness. And I am really trying to own that both as a writer and as a consumer. Like, like people will say, you should read this book. And I will say, will it make me happy? How will I feel at the end? Of, am I going to feel good about the world cry. after reading it? Or want to slip because my I, fist. Yeah, because yeah, <laughs> I don't want to, like, I'm sorry. I don't care how brilliant mm-hmm. it is. If I don't feel good out the other side of that book, I just don't want to read it. Like, yeah. And I'm just going to own that now. <laughs> like, um, and yeah. I give everybody permission to do the same. <laughs> that's right. I think that's terrific. I think that's terrific. Another part of the book that I enjoyed was your exploration of the, um, the Byronic or the, the Byronic he- hero. The yeah. Byronic hero. Yeah. And I just thought it was interesting how you compared, how you, just, how you talked about how you can cross that type of hero's journey with your heroine's journey and just kind of have all kinds of interesting complications. And um, I just thought that was very interesting. The hero can intrude into the hero's journey. I mean, humans love a binary, which is one of the reasons I'm cautious about like gender inflection and identities. But um, because despite how much we love a binary, we don't exist in one. Sorry, everybody, we just don't. So not everything is a hero and a heroine's journey. I talk specifically about Black Panther as part of that. Um, and, you know, there are others. I hate to say it, white folks, but there are other myths out there as well that like I don't have the skill set to explore. And I'm really hoping we get out of Africa, out of Asia, out of India, these like that are giving narrative foundations that are neither hero nor heroines to other cultures that we don't have access to. And hopefully we get access to come going forward in the world. Um, I merely wrote about the things I knew about. Um, which, which is not to so, and part of that writing and part of this book is, is I explore, first of all, what the two are like when they're completely separated from each other. And then second of all, what happens when they start mixing with each other, when you're writing something like a multiple POV narrative, like for example, Game of Thrones, where you have multiple different characters who are on different journeys, like some of them are on hero's journeys, some of them are on heroine's journeys. And in many cases, the ending dictates what kind of journey it was on, you were on. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes you can be like, oh, they get stronger the more isolated they are. So clearly on a, her- on a um, hero's journey, uh, the female fighter character in Game of Thrones is, a, is clearly a hero because she's always stronger when she starts getting isolated. Um, but but the, as authors, especially if you're an author who writes like, epic stuff for more more complicated things you're probably going to end up dealing with sort of intrusions of heroes and heroines um you know buddy cop dramas are very interesting or buddy dramas in particular are very interesting because you can have a hero uh, they're usually a hero and a heroine paired up with each other um and you can just think about like, like there's usually like the gritty cop who's solitary who's divorced who smokes and drinks too much and then there's usually the like funny guy who who, you know, has lots of girlfriends or is flirting with people or is happily married, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and is the partner character and they sort of balance off, off, off of each other. And you can do that with something like men in black or what have you, like you can have this, you know, um, Captain Marvel was a buddy cop drama. Yeah. Um, so, 
and, but that's a hero and a heroine kind of working in concert with each other. You're never quite sure where those narratives are going and know, you know, that heroin character is killed or not. Right? <laughs> Usually that's what, that's what happens. Oh, and then you're like, oh, we're in a, we're in a, a drama yeah, <laughs> or we're in a comedy. They end up together and, or, you know, happy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Or one I of think, them is converted. I mean, Men in Black, the hero character was literally stripped of his memory and converted into a heroine character at the very end and paired up and off he went yeah. to a happily ever after. I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's <an> interesting twist. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's so interesting. Just so many different varieties of ways you can combine things and work with it. It just has given me a lot of new options. So. Yeah, and the Byronic hero is a very interesting character. I mean, you mentioned specific interest in him. He's he, in romances. This is the rebel bad boy mm-hmm. who's often reformed by love. Mm-hmm. Um, but you see, yeah, Wolverine is a great example of a modern Byronic uh, Batman as well. Yeah, um, you know, Heathcliff is the old classical traditional. Yeah. Or I was um, thinking of Darcy. He's not so dark, but he is kind of moody and withdrawn. And he is. I understand but- him. You don't, I don't know how Byronic he is because he's always depicted surrounded by friends. So he's not That's super true. isolated. I mean, he has his little pack who clearly understands him and he cares very deeply for his sister. And of course, driving motivation for his hatred of what's his bucket is that he tried to separate from like he tried yeah. to take his sister away from him. And that's, that's a very heroine thing is like, do not take my family from me. Mm-hmm. That will drive me into action. Um but but yeah, the Byronic hero is is, is a interesting um, is an interesting character trope. Like when a Byronic hero is in a Byron, is in a hero's journey, he's quite self destructive. And again, Batman is a classical example example of that. When a Byronic hero is in a heroine's journey, he can often be redeemed by the heroine, um, which can go pear shaped in various ways <laughs> that I re- refer to rather crassly in the book. Um, yeah. the, <laughs> um, the idea that like all it takes is the love of a good woman mm-hmm. <laughs> and not some serious therapy is always yes, exactly. a little tra- a little self-examination. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I go into, so like, because I wrote this, this craft book from a commercial genre perspective, it means that I, I, I did have to go into the gothics. Um, the Victorian mm-hmm. gothics are basically what gave us kind of a lot of commercial genre now. So the adventures and mysteries and romances, horror um all of those come out of the gothic and so gothic archetypes um in particular but also the tropes but the ar- archetypes specifically have then kind of crossed into the hero heroine archetypes and mm-hmm. how they involve that to me is very interesting and also very useful to know mm-hmm. um from a writer perspective so i have a section on that in the book as well yeah that's just so interesting i i mean, i could listen to you talk like literally all day <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you have other things to do. Um, so tell us what you, the best thing you've done, you think to set yourself up for success. Oh, um, wow. Uh, okay. So this, this kind of takes us back to back out of the heroine's journey world and into <laughs> like the marketing practical side of it. Um, you guys gave me this question ahead of time. So I had a chance to like kind of formulate some thoughts on it. Um, I would say that for me, uh, from the get-go, I was very, very thoughtful about the dirty little word brand. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I wish we had a better word for that, but kind of like um, the idea of asking for help not being a weakness, I feel like we can own brand. Like, it's okay to take that word back. Um, but I was really thoughtful about, uh, like, everything, kind of the visual aspect of my brand as an author but how I constructed my um, my website, how things are written, how my bio is written, all that sort of thing. Like if you go visit my website and see the colors that it has, the images that it uses, but also like the way I write the script that's on that website and stuff, it's all very clearly my voice. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly the same voice you get in my fiction and in my nonfiction, quite frankly. Like I, I also consciously did not shift and it's a comedic, slightly old-fashioned tone of voice. And I con- I did not change that for the um, writing the heroine's journey either. And partly that's a little, like, tease-tease. I'm like, I'm going to write this casually, comedically, and fun, because I really want people to enjoy reading a nonfiction book. Uh, mm-hmm. One of my great battles with academia when I was an academic is why we had to write everything so dry. I'd be like, I can convey this and still have people enjoy reading this, but it will never be taken seriously. Mm-hmm. And so when I wrote nonfiction, I was like, 
same battle. <laughs> and yeah. I was like, I'm going to write the heroine's journey and be like, if you dismiss this book because of its breezy comedic style, that's kind of meta. Because yes. what I'm talking about is that these journeys are dismissed because they tend to have this breezy comedic style mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But also, it's my voice. So mm -hmm. like, that's, that's how I write. Um, so I think being very thoughtful about that really helped me from the get-go. Mm -hmm. And for me, being an aestheticist, it ties into the way I looked at events and the way I, what I dress in when I go to conventions and stuff like that. It's made me very recognizable over the years. Um, and also it's kind of like, if you don't like this, you're not going to like what I write. Like, right. So it's like the cover of a book. The cover of a book's function is not just to find the right readers for the story within it, but to warn off the wrong readers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I feel like I do that with my brand as well, which is just to be like, if you find Gail Carriger and you like the books, you're going to like the books. <laughs> right? Right, right. Like, if you like me, you're going to like my books. You're going to want to go shopping with me. We're going to have a grand old time. Like this right. is, we will have tea together someday. And I know you're going to be a friend of mine. Right. Um, and that's kind of the, the kind of like, like I heroine's journey branded in a strange way. I was like, we're doing this together. Let's do this thing. <laughs> if that's not your deal, then more power to you. Go find somebody who writes something that is your deal. Um, and I think I kind of sort of had that attitude from the very start on that. For me, that was really helpful because it meant when somebody hated, I was just like, I'm sorry, I'm not your thing. Like, yeah. yeah. I'm, yeah. I know I'm not people's things. Like I've had very various relationships over the years, and I was like, I know I'm not people's things. <laughs> We're good. That's funny. Yeah, the fact I, that you needed to tell me about it is weird, but okay. Yeah, exactly. Since we don't really know each other, but okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like I'm, but I'm sorry. I, that branding thing. I mean, I know what you're saying, but I think it's important, especially I think for indie authors because it is that promise you're making to a reader. I mean, you're making that promise and then, and it makes it easier for us to follow through on that promise when we have exactly. it lined up. Yeah. yeah. And I talk about this, I talk about reader betrayal and the contract with the reader as part of the hero and heroine's journeys um, in that book. But I feel like branding is kind of the public persona version of that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really helped me in terms of like kind of behavior online and all those sorts of guidelines too, because mm -hmm. I'm like, I everything I do is for my readers. Like the heroine's journey is the only thing I've ever done for the author community. <laughs> it's a terrible thing to admit. Um, publicly, mind yes. you. Yes. Um, like I do, I do this, I do podcasts. I yeah, do so talk I was going to say craft, you're very generous but... with going on podcasts and, <laughs> yeah. and helping authors. And so it's not the and, only thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, but generally speaking on like Twitter, for example, I'm not on Twitter to talk to other authors. Like I love you guys, but I'm not so why I'm there. Like I am there to talk to my readers. And if my readers are on Twitter, they find me and we, and I will share pictures of Victorian gowns and octopi. And I will talk about what tea I am drinking. And that is what they expect from me. And that is what they get on Twitter. And I am not going to participate in author pitch wars. I'm not, that is not why I'm there. Um, mm -hmm. and I'm like that on Facebook. And I'm like that on Tumblr. And I like I change my attitude each each location depending because they are specific in what they want from you as mm -hmm. content creators. Uh, but I'm like that on Instagram. Um, and I'm very upfront with that. I'm like, if you like literally on podcasts like this, I'm like, you can follow me, but you should follow me because I am modeling how to behave with readers, not because I'm going to give you advice as an author like that. Right. Otherwise, don't bother. <laughs> like, don't bother to follow. like, don't sign up for my newsletter. If you want craft advice, it's never going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, that's not why I do it. And that I like guidelines. So that kind of keeps me confined. I always know I, I never run out of ideas of what to write in my newsletter, know exactly what's going to happen every month, that kind of thing. Um, and for me, that's bit, that's really good because it, it, it allows me to manage not only the expectations of people interacting with me, but my own expectations mm -hmm. um, when I'm in those spheres. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very good. So was, good. Yeah. Yes. So where can people find out more about you? Well, there it is, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, my website is the best place. Uh, there's a contact page and on it is everything. Um, any place you would like to follow me on, you can follow me on. But like I said, uh, I don't talk about the craft of writing. <laughs> so I don't talk about the business of writing. 
um, if you want that kind of thing for me, it, it only really happens in forums, um, like mastermind groups and forums and stuff. And only if I'm interested in participating in the conversation. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I am not your mentor. Sorry. Um, I do this kind of thing in order to pay it forward. I wrote the heroine's journey in order to pay it forward. Um, but, but yeah, but I am on a lot of platforms, um, mm-hmm. in, in at least a, a limited way. Uh, yeah, you can always drop me a calling card. That is the best way to get my attention. I have a, it's basically an email set up on my mm-hmm. website. Um, the other oh. thing I do have on my website is a resources drop down that does include sort of, if I get asked what, a question often enough, I will write a blog post, even if it's a craft question. So there are a couple of like logs of resources of articles that I blog or articles I've written on the craft of writing, the business of writing, beginning writing and mid-career writing, like kind of random tips and tricks and things that I've run across that I find, like I just get questions about so much that I will eventually write a blog post on the subject. So, um, and that's, there's a drop down on my website for resources and that's all there. So for, for the authors who are listening, I, I do have some articles and stuff out there. <laughs> I'm going to run off right now and read this. As <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they might not be like, I try and title them. So like, it's really mm-hmm. clear, you know, like, like I have a blog post on how to use the WordPress plugin redirection as a universal link maker. Like, Mm. not everybody wants that but occasionally it comes up in writers groups and people are like what 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 and I'm like yeah you don't you don't have to use bit.ly you can use it proprietary and and you know people's minds are blown you know so it's stuff like that that's great great. that is awesome thank you for being here being here thanks for having me yeah it was so fun and you were just so great Uh, tons of information yeah Yes, I think people I know, really sorry. No, it's no. awesome. I think that's it's been great. And we will have all the links and everything at wish I'd known then podcast.com and we'll see everybody next week. Thanks for being yeah, here. Thank, thank you again for having me. It was great. Bye, Bye guys. Thanks for listening to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. We hope this episode inspired you, empowered you, and made you laugh a little bit too. If you loved it, tell your friends about it. And if you feel so inclined, leave us a review. We look forward to being with you again next week.